Okay, here we are, chapter 20, and the title is Whose Government? Politics, Populists, and Progressives, 1880-1917, okay? And this, this chapter talks a lot about politics, and especially the Republicans versus the Democrats, okay? So does anybody know where the two parties got their animal logos? Uh, well, start with the Democrats, the election of 1828. Uh, Andrew Jackson's opponents called him a jackass, and he thought that was kind of funny, so he put a donkey logo on his campaign material, and it stuck as a logo for the Democrats. And today, they say that the donkey is smart and brave, okay? Uh, Thomas Nast, the famous 19th century political cartoonist, created, created a, a political cartoon that showed the donkey clothed in lion skin. You're scaring away all the animals in the zoo, but except for the elephant. And the elephant in, in his cartoon was entitled The Republican Vote. So the, so the, so the elephant stayed firm, not, not afraid of the donkey and lion skin. So that label stuck. And today the Republicans say the elephant is strong and dignified. Okay, so we're, gonna, we're going to look, look more at the politics of this era. We've looked at the social reactions to it, their reactions to the Industrial Revolution, uh, we've talked a lot about that. The wounds of the Civil War were not healing quickly. And Republicans and Democrats, as we learn in the Reconstruction, Chapter 15, <clears throat> they were at each other's throats constantly. So the, the defeat, uh, even, even 30, 25, 30 years later, was still fresh for the South, okay? Uh, and, you know, although the failures of Reconstruction, as we know, allowed them to reconstruct a society very much like the one they lost, okay? So this idea of relying on a past legacy regarding the Civil War to pump up a cause became known as, as waving the bloody shirt. Uh, it was to revive the images and gory memories of the Civil War to get elected. Look, look at me. I, I fought in the war. Here's my bloody shirt to prove it, okay? So people, men, would use... Their Civil War experience, you know, as, as little as that may have been, of course, exaggerated, right, to to gain, you know, office and, and popularity, okay? Um, but understand, the, the wounds of that war were still fresh, and some had difficulty letting go of it. Uh, and, and this happens to people that go through a monumental event. It becomes the legacy of their lives, and it becomes a huge part of society, until they're all gone, you know. What once once everybody that lived it is gone, then 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 you know it, it kind of recedes into the past. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So this period is also known as the Gilded Age. Uh, that that sounds kind of nice, I guess. Uh, this is from your book definition: a period of ostentatious ostentatious displays of wealth, growing poverty, and government inaction in the face of income inequality, okay? Uh, so, the, so the Gilded Age. And here you see Uncle Sam, you know, looking down at all the workers. Get to work. This is what, what, this is what America's about. It's a, you know, it, it, it had become about income inequality and separation, okay? Uh, Mark Twain, the famous author, said America had achieved a glittery outer coating of prosperity and lofty rhetoric, but underneath suffered from moral decay. Okay. Okay, let's do a supplemental lecture right here, number six. This is called Assassinations. America has a violent history. So the point I'm trying to make here in this supplemental lecture before we start is that America has a violent history. And I, I, I use assassinations as, as, a, as evidence to potentially prove that, okay? Uh, it goes a little bit further, further than, than that, as you'll see. But anyway, so, so that's kind of the premise of this uh, uh, lecture, okay? Okay, so in, in our era, the Gilded Age, there, there were two presidential assassinations in this, in this period. Now, most people don't, don't know that there, there have been four assassinated presidents. Lincoln and Kennedy get all the all the all the press, right? Uh, but there were two others, and and these these two happened in our era. The first one, James Garfield, 20th president, and on July 2nd, 1881, only four months into his term, <clears throat> he was shot in Washington D.C. by a mentally imbalanced man named Charles Guiteau. Charles Guiteau, G uh, G U I T E A U. Okay. 
uh, Guteau had been attempting to gain an office from Garfield. And we'll talk uh, later about the kind of repercussions of that and, and, and what a what an office seeker is or was, okay? The other president that was assassinated in this era was William McKinley and assassinated in 1901, uh, 25th president. So 20 years after uh, Garfield, McKinley is assassinated. <clears throat> he was shot while attending the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York, shot by a man named Leon Cholzgos. That's Leon C uh, Cholzgos, C-Z-O-L-G-O-S-Z. An anarchist, and uh, you know, it was responsible. So we talked about anarchy before. Anarchism and anarchists, you know, make themselves known during this period. And just to kind of little sidebar, get away from the American assassinations a little bit, but just just to throw it in because it happened at the same time. Archduke Franz Ferdinand uh, and his wife um, were were both assassinated by anarchists. Uh, this this photo here uh, is minutes before they were killed. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so who who is he? Uh, he's he's the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the, the heir to the Austria Austria Hungarian throne. Uh, this happens in Sarajevo, um, a member of a secret society known as the Black Hand. And the assassin's name was Gavrilo Princip, G-A-V-R-I-L-O Princip, P-R-I-N-C-I-P, -I -I okay, June 28, 1914. What's important about this and why I'm throwing this in here is that this event sparks World War I. This is the event that starts that war, okay? Okay, but back back to our two assassinated presidents, Garfield and McKinley. Uh, so so two murdered presidents in 20 years. That that's that's a lot. Okay, two two you know people in the, in the supreme power position in America are assassinated by by mixing with the public. Okay, so if you go back a little bit and you add Lincoln in, Lincoln was assassinated in April of April. I'm sorry, April of 1865. That's three presidents assassinated in 36 years. That's uh, pretty amazing. Uh, a president's assassinated the average one, once every 12 years. Okay, If you move forward from our era and go to Kennedy, John Kennedy was assassinated in 1963. And um, that makes it four presidents in 98 years. Okay, So four, four presidents in 98 years assassinated. That's, a, that's an amazing statistic, okay, uh, going from Lincoln to Kennedy <clears throat> four times. The leader of America is killed uh, while in public, okay, so uh, speaks, you know, pretty loudly of a violent society, okay. Now, if you go back to, to day one in this class, we talked about Zachary Taylor. Remember the lecture about Silas Dean, right? Remember, they disinterred him because uh, there was a thought that he'd been poisoned. Uh, he was the 12th president. So you add him into the mix, and it's five presidents in 113 years. So uh, what is that? That's an average of um, one every 22 years. Okay? Um, that's pretty amazing. Now, we, we, we can't really add Zach in here because it's never been confirmed. Okay? So we'll go back to our, our four and ninety-eight years, but that's that's the official count. That that's amazing. I, I can't think of another country <clears throat> where four of their leaders were assassinated, murdered in less than one hundred years, and all and like I said before, all these men were killed while they were in public, mixing with the masses. <clears throat> now, if you continue on with this and you add in attempts, okay, I think I just um, okay, uh, there were nineteen attempts. <clears throat> in 176 years on president's lives, not just, you know, uh, politicians in general. These are all on president's lives. <clears throat> now, you see the ones that are bolded are the ones that were successful. Lincoln, Garfield, McKinley, Kennedy, um, you know, they were actually killed. The other ones were unsuccessful, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> now, I'm just showing you this list. Uh, you don't have to know this. Uh, this is just more for your own interest. If you're interested, uh, it is not required on your essay answer to list all these. But if you want to take some information from this list for your answer, that's, that'd be great. Okay. So when you add in all, all of these 19 attempts in 176 years, that's an average of an attempt on a president's life every nine years. 
Okay, so once every nine years, on the average, a, a president is is uh, has an assassination attempt against them. That speaks pretty loudly about the violent society of America. 19 attempts, 176 years, average of one every nine years. <clears throat> those those would be good statistics for you to have in your answer, okay? Okay, you, you throw in people that weren't the president uh, and attempts and, and successes. Robert Kennedy, Medgar Evers, George Wallace, Martin Luther King, Huey Long, Malcolm X, and, and just recently, Gabrielle Giffords. Now, not all those were successful. Some were uh, uh, Kennedy, Evers, King, Huey Long, Malcolm X, all killed. But the point I'm trying to make is there's a whole lot more uh, attempts with successes on politician, okay? politicians. Okay, uh, And the list grows quickly. These, these are the more famous ones, you know, and there's, but there's been many more assassinations of American politicians, okay? So, so what's my point? America is a violent place. Is it true that America is more violent than European countries? America came from Europe. America is, you know, uh, Europe is their brethren. It's, it's, it's their, their roots, right? Uh, the United States was founded by white Europeans that immigrated from Europe. So why is it so m much more violent in America today than other European countries? <clears throat> Excuse me. Is it true? Statistics say so. This is a, a uh, uh, evidence here. This is homicides by firearms per 1 million people. Okay, In Germany, 1.9. Austria, 2.2. Denmark, 2.7. Canada jumps up a little, 5.1. But look at the United States, 29.7. So, you know, six times almost its closest competitor, 15 times more than, than the lowest one. Okay. Uh, and just to throw it in, <clears throat> mental illness in the United States is comparable to other Western countries. So it's not just about mental illness in the United States. Every country ha has the same issue, okay? There just happens to be a whole lot more, uh, you know, murders in America than anywhere else by firearms, okay? <clears throat> and which is interesting, America's thought of as being maybe – the most civilized, you know, more than any other country in some cases, progressive uh, land, uh, uh, country, land of, land of freedom, people living the dream. <clears throat> Yet the truth is, America is a very violent country, from gang warfare to school shootings, insurance fraud schemes for life insurance policies. You have the ID channel on TV. It's an entire channel, 24 hours of endless stories about murder for money, cold-blooded murder, spouses killing sp each other's uh, parents. <clears throat> so, so again, why, why so much more than other European countries? Well, you know, unlike Europe, uh, America had a has a long history of violence, starting from the very beginning. We've talked about this a little bit before. You know, the uh, enslavement of people and the and the torture and abuse of them in many cases. Uh, the you know genocide against Native Americans and the pushing out and and removal of them from society. Uh, you know, women of all races and and uh, uh, income brackets have been abused throughout American history. OK, I said in day one that racism is interwoven into the fabric of America. OK, <clears throat> OK, to end the to end this supplemental lecture, according to the uh, 1960s uh, civil rights leader, H. Rat Brown. And this is a quote from uh, 1967. <clears throat> violence is as American as cherry pie. Okay. Okay. That is the official end of that supplemental lecture. So, you know, again, I kind of set the stage about violence in America by giving you statistics about assassinations. Okay. For 98 years is a, is a, is a good one to, to, to uh, have on your answer. Uh, 19 attempts in 176 years, one every nine years is good. Uh, but, but essentially, that sets the stage. Then I give you some statistics that kind of prove it. You know, America's you know, in that in the in that graph I showed you. You know, many many times uh, more murders here than anywhere else. Okay, so the whole point is to try to prove that America is a violent country. Okay. <clears throat> okay, we're gonna do. Um, 
<clears throat> so that's the end of that supplemental lecture, okay? Okay, we're going to do look at three short videos here, okay? The first one is called Violence in American Tradition. That's the first one that I want you to watch. But please, um, while, while you're welcome to watch the whole thing, I, I believe it's nine something minutes long, uh, <clears throat> all that's required is that you watch the first two and a half minutes of it. It, it essentially is the introduction. When you, when you get to the title, then go ahead and, and, and stop watching, okay? Uh, however, you are welcome to watch the, the whole thing. It really kind of is a history of violence against Native Americans, but you don't have to watch that. Okay, so go ahead and watch that film and then come, come back. Okay, we're, we're going to watch three here in a row, but, but come, come back first before you go to the, the second one. Okay, go ahead and watch the film. Okay, the next film <clears throat> is a short talk by a man named John Whitehead a noted civil rights attorney and author, okay? This is kind of a conversation uh, with a, you know, a civil rights attorney. And this is called, Why is America so Violent? Uh, so go ahead and watch that one, <clears throat> and then watch the, the third one also. Uh, so first watch, Why is America so Violent? And then, and then next watch the perception versus reality of violent crime in America, okay? Go ahead and watch those two. <clears throat> Okay, so the last film suggests that it's not as bad as we think. Is it, is it all social media and modern technology that makes it seem worse than it actually is? You know, 40 years ago, there, there was not instant access to the news. You know, it's different today. Today, an eyewitness can post a video, and it can go viral, and everyone gets upset about it, okay? So, you know, we're in San Diego, California, right? Essentially, I guess we're, yeah, we're in San Diego, California. And uh, so a murder in Des Moines, Iowa, you know, and I'm, I'm making this up, it becomes international news today. And in San Diego, we hear about it. Where 40 years ago, nobody outside of Des Moines would ever hear about it. So, you know, there's always been murders and they'll probably continue. Uh, but today, perhaps it feels like it's bigger because we hear about so many of them where in the past we didn't. Uh, today we have 24-hour news, you know, roaming the countryside, <clears throat> looking for any story. <clears throat> looking for any story, excuse me, um, you remember yellow journalism, sensationalizing the news. Uh, you know, when there's, a, when there's a murder in Des Moines, Iowa, now, now all the news channels park their vans there for two months and harass the people involved in, in, the, in the murder, okay, or the people that, that, that are related to the person, whatever it might be. Uh, you know, murder sells, and people want to know. So even though it may be less, feels like more. So according to the film, it's less, but it feels like more. But the point is, I don't think anyone would disagree or argue against. America is a very violent nation, okay? Okay, I talked about office seekers with Garfield, and an office seeker uh, is who to kill him. So in, the, in, in these days, you had much more access to the president than you do today. Now, truth is, uh, if you go back to Lincoln, before Lincoln was assassinated, you you literally could walk to the up to the White House, knock on the door and go inside. You might see the president walking down the street. Okay, that that was that was the way it was then. When Lincoln was killed, the, the you know Secret Service began and and there started to, to be you know protection for these people. But 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 even even by the time of Garfield, uh, what 20, 20 or so years later. It still hadn't become like it is today, where the president is completely sequestered away from everybody. Um, so what happened in those days? You, a a person would would campaign and run for the presidency. Okay, and in in a campaign, this is a pretty you know big election. The president, you have lots of supporters and lots of people that volunteer and give you their time and you know do what they stuff envelopes, uh, you know whatever it might be, especially in those days. When you are elected, many of those people think that you now owe them a job. Okay, hey, I, I supported you. Uh, give me give me some kind of government job. So in those days, um, a president would be elected. In his first few weeks, there'd be a line around the White House of people looking for jobs, office seekers, and. Um, you know, they, they, they were they were looked at as kind of like cockroaches, like get these people out. They, they were kind of, you know, uh, out there with their hands out, you know, uh, help me out. You know, it's payback time. Give, give me give me something. I, I supported you. OK. 
So because of what happened to Garfield, of course he was killed by an office seeker, they, the, uh, the, uh, the Pendleton Act of 1883 was passed. This is the Magna Carta of civil service reform. So uh, 14,000 out of 117,000 jobs became civil service exam positions. So what, what, what does that mean? It means that instead of the president saying, yeah, here's your job, you have to pass an exam, okay? And this is a civil service exam. And we still have the same thing today. You know, federal jobs <clears throat> are filled by people that pass these exams. <clears throat> Not just appointed by someone as a political favor, okay? So, so the Pendleton laws put talented professionals in office and discouraged politicians from appointing unqualified party hacks, okay? So what's a hack? A hack is a person with a professional job or title that is not really qualified to do the job. So, you know, you're, you're not really qualified at all. You're just appointed by the president. He's thanking you for helping him campaign, okay? Uh, probably the, the one that was most famous for this is Andrew Jackson, who fired his entire cabinet and then uh, put put his friends and cronies in to those positions. They, they really weren't qualified, but, you know, that's what he did, okay? Okay, moving forward with politics. So in this era, there's there was a group called the Mugwumps, the Great American Mugwump. So what is that? A Mugwump, a Mugwump, sorry, sits on a fence with his mug on one side and his wump on the other. So I'm not going to get into the uh, descriptions of anatomical parts here, but you kind of get the idea, right? So who are these people? <clears throat> these are these are Republicans that left their party to support the Democrat. Grover Cleveland for president in 1884. We're going to talk more about Cleveland here in, in a minute. So these are reform-minded liberals that fought corruption and called for smaller government. And, you know, again, 1884, you remember the Republicans kind of were in disarray at the end of Reconstruction 1877. So this is kind of a down period for the Republicans in this very long period of Republican domination. We talked about that from from James Buchanan to Franklin Roosevelt, 72 years, it was a Republican dominant period, except for two times. And this is one of them. Cleveland is, is one of two men that, that were elected president in that in that era that was a Democrat. OK, <clears throat> so it's interesting how people campaign, how campaigns have changed in this era. Uh, there was a change in how presidential candidates campaigned for office. You know, it, in, in this era, it had been considered vain for a person to campaign on their own behalf. It seemed greedy that you were looking for face time and that you that wasn't what it was about. So a, cam, a, a candidate would have others campaign for him and the candidate would stay out of the limelight. Stay, stay kind of in the in the you know in, in the wings, not 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 out there smiling, shaking hands. Let somebody else do that. So of course it's changed quite a bit, right? Can can you imagine a reserved Donald Trump in in 2016, where he where he was told, uh, Mr. Trump, I'm sorry, but you can't do the speech. We don't want anybody to think that you're that you're greedy or vain. You know, I'm going to do it for you. Can you imagine taking that opportunity from him? And let, let's not, let's be fair, Hillary too, right? She, would, she wouldn't have been happy. You know, the, these candidates want their face time, right? So it's different today. Candidates today are known for their big egos. <clears throat> but back then it was the opposite. The, the, the uh, candidates were humble, okay? Um, but it was during this era that it all changed. You know, candidates began to see the value of putting their faces in view of the people to familiarize themselves, to be remembered. And it, it really is true that the that what makes that happen is technology, uh, you know, photography and getting pictures taken and putting them on posters and uh, railroads is a big part of campaign that we'll talk and I'll, I'll explain that to you here in a minute, okay? Uh, <clears throat> stump speeches. Now, what's a stump speech? If you if you kind of think of a, of a tree that's maybe – got a three foot wide trunk, okay? Then you and then you cut the tree down and maybe the stump that's left is two feet tall, okay? A candidate can can gather a crowd around him and stand on the stump and be two two, three feet above the crowd. So maybe there maybe the crowd's 20, 20 people th uh, deep. The people in the back can see you because you're standing on the stump. So that that's what a stump speech is. And and what 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 they would do is they would they would give a standardized short speech 
the same speech. They give it over and over in different towns, okay? Uh, now, did they actually go to every town and stand and stump every time? Probably not, but but this is kind of the you know the symbolic name for this idea of <clears throat> of a candidate going from town to town giving the same short speech over and over. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so symbolically standing on a stump so everyone can see them. Now I mentioned railroads. So Teddy Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, he starts to use trains as a way to campaign. So what he would do is he would alert towns along the rail line, maybe you know, 10, 15 towns, uh, short stops, maybe three, four miles apart. He would let them know what time he'd be in town, and everybody would come to the train station. And when his train pulled up, he would come to the back of the caboose, right, like you see in the in the image here, and everyone would gather around the train. He'd give his standardized speech to everybody. He'd wave goodbye, and the train would take off and go to the next town, do it again. So, you know, this is an, this is an effective way of reaching a cross-section of people in general. Uh, and, and what happens to the people that, you know, um, that, that saw him, <clears throat> they tell all their friends that couldn't make it about seeing the candidate, and he becomes popular. You know, there's something about seeing a president. You know, you, 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 don't, you don't forget it. You know, I know when uh, Clinton came to the town that I grew up in, went to a park, that I used to hang out in when I was a kid and he gave a speech there and it was a pretty big deal, you know, and you remember that because it doesn't matter what, what party you are, you know, what your partisanship is, seeing a president is a pretty big deal. <clears throat> it's kind of cool. So people don't forget that, you know, and so he's able to, you know, kind of create this wide appeal by, by going from stop to stop on the railroad. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, also, front porch campaigns. Now, you wouldn't have this today, but, but candidates would campaign from home, and they'd invite people to come to their house, and they'd come out in the front porch and give their standardized speech. <clears throat> okay. I can't imagine that we'd go up to Donald Trump's home today and listen to him speak, but you know, times have changed. But everything's different today because you don't need to do these things because you have television and the internet, and you know you can get all the FaceTime you want if you get if you have enough money. Okay. Okay, so modern campaign strategies began in this era. You know, another example of the modern world as we know it taking shape over a hundred years ago. Okay, uh, so so we're still talking about the progressive era. Uh, this is still about reforms. Uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, we're going to get to you here in a minute. It was big on that. Uh, so th this this era is still still going. Okay, one of the one of the acts that was passed in this era, 1890, is the Sherman Antitrust Act, made illegal to form trusts that interfere with free trade between states and other countries. Okay, uh, so it prohibited any combination in the form of trusts or otherwise conspiracies, anything that was in restraint of trade. Uh, the Sherman Antitrust Act forbade anti-competitive business activities. So the federal government would investigate trusts, okay? This is the precursor to trust busting that would be made famous by, by Theodore Roosevelt. So he, he, he will become known as the trust buster. He's the guy that, that, that you know, want, wants, to, wants to knock all these, all these trusts and, and monopolies down, okay? Okay, so we talked about Grover Cleveland being one of two Democrats that was elected in a 72-year period. That, that's all it was, one in, one in two. First Democrat since James Buchanan before the Civil War, 28 years of, of Republican presidents, okay? <clears throat> but the truth is, you know, time was passing since the end of the war, and new ideas were replacing the old ones, okay? Uh, and as the, as the country expanded, uh, Western states were added. There were 10 added since 1863, uh, the people in the West were different than the people in the East. So the, Rep the Republicans' grip as a party, you know, was slipping a little bit as these new Western states came in, okay? So things started to change. And mostly became reform-minded because of the abuses of the Industrial Revolution, okay? And you have the rise of the uh, populist people, uh, populist party, sorry, or People's Party, originally called the People's Party, uh, became known as the Populist Party. So this is inspired by labor organizations. What did they do? They would they would defend farmers against the elite class. They, they would defend people against businesses, railroads, corporations, any 
any type of monopoly, okay? <clears throat> okay, what I want you to do here is take another break and uh, uh, please, uh, where am I here? I'm sorry, there I am. Please watch the film entitled The People's Party, okay? Uh, so go ahead and watch that and then come, come back. Okay, so the Populist Party declared their Omaha platform in 1892. Uh, we believe that the power of government, in other words, of the people, should be expanded as rapidly and as far as the good sense of an intelligent people and the teachings of experience shall justify. To end that oppression, injustice, and poverty should eventually cease. So this is a reform-minded party, right? The populists were a party of the people, especially farmers, and a direct result <clears throat> of the progressive movement. Okay, so so you have this progressive movement is still in, in, in force. Okay, now I, I said earlier that every time there's a solid reform movement or party in American history, in this case a party, something would happen that caused the change course. Now, of course, the progressive era would, would come to a, a thud halt at at the start of World War One, but in the middle, this this party was kind of derailed by what what was called the Panic of 1893. Now we talked about the Panic of 1873 during the Reconstruction era. Remember that was the one that, that kind of um, starts the end of, of the Reconstruction and the, and the rebuilding of the South. Okay, and ended ended up with the Republicans turning their back on the freed people in the South. So this is another one, 20 years later, and, you know, this is these happen. As we know, in 2008-9, we had a pretty bad recession of our own. Uh, so this happens in a capitalist country. Um, so the Panic of 1893 um, kind of, uh, you know, puts an end or, or at least derails for a while all these reforms because people have – you know, more important things to worry about than, than the welfare of somebody else. If you can't pay your mortgage, you're losing your house, you lost your job, you know, it's a bad thing. So people tend to circle the wagons and, and defend themselves, okay? So so um, so the Republicans, who, of course, had lost the presidency for the first time in 20 years, they, they blame the, the Democrats and, and, their, and the president, Grover Cleveland, for this panic, okay? Now, just this little sidebar. Cleveland's an interesting guy. He he's the only president to have been elected to two non I'm sorry to a yes two non consecutive terms. So if you look at those those years, his first presidency ended in 1889. Then he lost. But then he came back four years later and won again. So he was president at two different times. He was the 22nd and 24th president. In between him was Benjamin Harrison. Okay. Uh, so Cleveland, um, you know, out of 45 presidents that we have today, uh, Trump's the 45th, there's only been 44 men because Cleveland did it twice, okay? Okay, but the, but the country blames him for this panic, and they, they blame the Democrats, okay? Uh, and, and the Republicans regain their clout, and they gain majorities in both houses of Congress for 15 more years. So, so again, I, I've said it a couple times, the, the Republicans dominated politics from 1861 to 1933, 72 years. And in that time, only two Democrats were elected, Cleveland and Woodrow Wilson. Now, you could argue that there were three because uh, Cleveland did it twice, okay? Okay, um, <clears throat> So what, what did this panic develop from? Some farm foreclosures, railroad bankruptcies, you know, investment dollars dry up, the stock market tumbles, banks fail. And you know, what happens? You know, the, the, the ruling class is fearful of the, of the workers and, and unrest. Uh, the ruling class fear the ideas of Marxism and socialism, communism. Uh, you know, all these types of ideologies, you know, seek to inspire workers to revolt. OK, so I said Marxism. What, what is Marxism? This is this is, comes from the, the man named Karl Marx. Uh, Karl Marx was a socialist thinker and his theories about society, economics and politics is known as Marxism. OK, and this is the idea that human societies develop through class struggle. OK. Okay, so let's take a break here and watch the next film. The next film is entitled Political Theory, Karl Marx. So go ahead and watch that and come back, okay? 
Okay. Um, so the, the Marxist theory, Marx believed that there were conflicts between the ruling classes, and he called he called those the bourgeois. You see here on the um, on the uh, slide the bourgeois, and who were they? they? They controlled the means of production. This is the ruling class. These are the, the these are the are the business owners, the bourgeois. Uh, and then the working class is the proletariat right here, okay? And who were they? They they sell their labor for wages, right? And, uh, and so you have this, this conflict, okay? Uh, Marx also claimed that the, the ideology of capitalism was based on inequality and the exploitation of labor. And, you know, you can find a lot of evidence to that, right? The entire Industrial Revolution is about very wealthy billionaires making, you know, having this, this, these, you know, uh, very wealthy lives and living lives of, of, of luxury while the workers, you know, live in, in, in poverty and, and, you know, hungry and cold. So you, lots of evidence to that. Capitalism, according to Marx, capitalism was based on inequality and the exploitation of labor. Okay. So, again, according to Marx, the ruling class ran the government, controlled the economy, but it represented itself as being in favor of everyone, in favor of the people, okay? Uh, Marx felt that capitalism would always result in societal tensions between the two classes, and this is the key part. It would ultimately self-destruct and be replaced by a new system called socialism, so, so again, that's important to understand. Capitalism would always result in tensions between the two classes, the ruling elite and the working class, but ultimately it would self-destruct and be replaced by a new system called, <coughs> excuse me, called socialism. Okay. Uh, so we talked about this, the Bolshevik Revolution. We talked about the Progressive Era avoid another American Revolution, like like what happened in Russia. Okay. Uh, so we, we know about these conflicts between the working upper and working classes in America. And again, did the progressive era avoid another revolution? I mean, it's, you know, there's, it's a, it's a pretty solid argument that perhaps it did. Okay. Okay. So, uh, once the, once the capital, once capitalism self destructs, it's replaced by socialism. This is all according to Marx. Okay. So what is socialism? An economic and political philosophy based on the idea that the benefits of e economic activity, wealth, should be equally distributed throughout a society. So, so not not where the top two percent get ninety nine percent of the money, spread it out. It does not mean that that the owner of a company gets an equal share as as the as the you know lowest worker on the line. It doesn't mean that, but it means that instead of the owner making you know. Ten billion dollars while everyone's starving. Go ahead and make eight billion and spread the two billion out so your so your workers live better, so they're healthier. That that's that's what that's what what wealth inequality is truly about. Okay, okay. Socialists emphasize cooperation and social responsibility as ways to achieve a more equitable distribution of both income and opportunity, thus reducing great differences between rich and poor. Okay. Uh, according to your book, socialism, it advocates for the means of production, distribution, and exchange, or the economics of a society, okay? Businesses should be owned and regulated by a community as a whole, not, not by a, a wealthy man, okay? Socialists wanted to take business out of the hands of the social elites and put it in the hands of the common people. So put, <clears throat> put economics and business in the hands of, of people and spread the wealth out, not, not have one, you know, rich, opulent man at the top. OK. <clears throat> OK. Um, so in America, is there anybody today that's called a socialist? Well, yeah, Bernie Sanders was uh, part of the 2016 uh presidential campaign uh he you know is considered to be a socialist he he kind of has these ideas in mind okay uh, you know what what bigger government you know government of of social programs to help people that's kind of where he where he comes from okay okay back back to <clears throat> back to marx's theory okay so so again just to review uh capitalism 
would result in tensions between the, the working class and the, and the upper class, would ultimately self-destruct to be replaced by socialism that we just talked about, okay? And then once the workers were in control, they would develop a class consciousness. It's an awareness that would spark a revolution and, <clears throat> excuse me, create a dictatorship of the proletariat, transforming it from a wage-earning propertyless, propertyless mass into the ruling class. What does that mean? So, so Marx believed the working class would rise collectively and remove the ruling elite and then become that themselves. They would become the ruling elite. But instead of having, you know, uh, one or two or five, you know, very rich, you know, uh, people at the top, the ruling elite becomes everybody. OK, <clears throat> this is this is socialism. So according to Marx, what is the last step? The step is communism. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, communism is a philosophy of government and society based on the ideals of Marx, okay? <clears throat> and it stresses the following, classless, stateless society, sounds like, like anarchy, uh, common ownership of all resources, no private property, social equality, okay? So um, I said it sounds like anarchy because anarchy – Anarchists wanted a stateless society also, but don't don't forget what's going on here on on our on our chart of the right and the left. You know, anarchy is when you go go all the way to the right where you have no government. That's anarchy. That's mob rule. Uh, communism, communism, is, and Nazism is when you go all the way to the left. <clears throat> that's big government where the government controls everything. So so communism and anarchy are are on the the opposite. You know, size of the political spectrum. Okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> so, where, so where am I going with all this? Um, what, why is this important to understand in American history about communism, socialism, and the Russian Revolution, and all that? Well, I mean, first of all, it's it's the <clears throat> it's the antithesis of America. Capitalism is the opposite of communism. Okay, so so Americans, American government is is at odds with anybody that's communist. Okay. But the, the entire 20th century, <clears throat> sorry, I missed that. That's, a, that's your, your book's um, definition of communism. And if you, you can go ahead and, and read that and write that down if you want. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm having a bad voice day like usual. Uh, why is this important? In the 20th century, 1917, the Russian Revolution happens. <clears throat> and you start a communist country. But 1945, the end of World War II, is when, when it really – really starts to become undone between the United States and Russia, okay? Uh, the United States and Russia go, go at it for the rest of the 20th century. And, you know, the, uh, the, the time between the end of World War II and 1990, that's what, that's what uh, the United States foreign policy is about, is stopping the spread of the communists from Russia, okay? Russia and, the, and the, what's called the Soviet Union – are at each other's throats, they, they still are. They become mortal enemies, okay? This is the main theme <clears throat> for the entirety of the 20th century. <clears throat> um, in, in my lifetime, yeah, that's all I all I ever knew was Russia versus the United States. I grew up in the Cold War, and we'll talk about it here in a minute. <clears throat> okay, so, so communism is a form of government, and fighting against it became the main theme in America, for this, at least the second half of the 20th century, okay? And this turned into what is called a Cold War after World War II. Now, World War I, World War II, Russia and the United States were allies. They were on the same side, fighting Germany and Italy. Um, but after World War II, they, they went different directions. They, they became enemies. Both, both became world powers at this war. And... Uh, both knew that if they went to war, they would annihilate the world because it would be a nuclear war that would that would destroy the world. So they 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 didn't want to do that. So you have what's called a cold war. So cold war, it's a war nonetheless, but not a hot war, you know, with battles and <clears throat> ammunition flying and, and and that type of thing. A cold war is you know both sides jockeying for position to stay ahead of each other. So you have a space race, arms race, you know, the threat of nuclear war. <clears throat> and, and, you know, this, these ideas would paint almost an entire century of the 20th century, okay? 
Okay, back to our <clears throat> politics. So the populists we were talking about, they, they tried to implement a plan that was cross-racial. This is interesting for the 19th century, very racist, discriminating era. Uh, but yet they, they come up with a different point of view or idea about it, okay? <clears throat> the accident of color can make no difference in the interests of farmers, croppers, and laborers. You are kept apart that you may be separately fleeced of your earnings. So, so what are they saying here? You know, they're saying, you know, guys, let, let's stop fighting about color. All of us are, are working class, whether you're black or white or brown. We're all working class. The man at the top is, is keeping us apart to rip us off easier. Okay, so let's come together. Let's let's you know gain gain a solidarity that, that's cross racial. All of us shouldn't be worried about color. We should come together because we're we're working class. We 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 have a commonness. We have a you know have that in common. So let's let's get together, organize and and gain power in numbers. Have a solidarity and fight these people. Okay, <clears throat> so. So populists condone solidarity amongst agricultural workers of all colors. And this is kind of similar to an enclave. We talked about enclaves and, and the political machines. You know, power comes from numbers of people with the same goal, okay? <clears throat> so uh, cross-racial solidarity. What do you think the Southern Democrats felt about that? Uh, not not very happily. You know, these are these are racist white supremacists that, that are, in, you know, in this era trying to reclaim the South. Okay, from you know from the uh, all these uh, freedoms that the newly freed slave had. They didn't want that. Okay, so they they respond harshly, <clears throat> and they criticize populists for advocating for Negro rule. Okay, uh, and they resorted to fraud and violence to to get to get their way, okay? Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, and this is a pretty uh, alarming quote, okay? We've done our level best to block every last black vote. We stuffed ballot boxes. We shot them. We are not ashamed of it, okay? <clears throat> so this is 1900, you know, th 35 years after the slaves were emancipated and 22 years since the end of Reconstruction, okay? Um, so doesn't it sound a lot like the uh, pre-Civil War South? I mean, it doesn't sound a lot different, okay? And I, I keep on saying that, but but that's that's the that's the truth, okay? Um, <clears throat> you know, it, it was the South was not different for most Black people after the war, and even even this many years later, and and again, proof of the failures of the Reconstruction era. <clears throat> okay, the the South uh, had a had a legal case, Williams versus Mississippi, <clears throat> and this is an attempt to try to reinstitute white supremacy. So this case allowed for literacy tests and poll taxes. So again, this is unconstitutional against the law. A literacy test where you have to pass, we talked about it a class or two ago. <clears throat> Excuse me, I cannot get my throat clear today. <clears> throat> Uh, and also poll taxes. It, it, it shouldn't. You, you don't have to be smart to vote in America. You don't have to be. You don't have to pay for it. It's a. It's a freedom given to all citizens. Okay, <clears throat> but for some reason the Supreme Court struck down the grandfather clause. So they they got rid of the grandfather clause, but kept the other two. Okay, <clears throat> again the Supreme Court made some pretty amazing decisions in, the, in this era. Uh, they were known. They are known historically as a very racist court. But this is the this is the, the, the highest court in the land that they're supposed to be the people that interpret the Constitution and pass laws based on it. Yet here they're passing laws one after another that's unconstitutional. But what what, what are you going to do? I mean, the, the the Supreme Court's the last word. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> again, that this violates the Fifteenth Amendment. Okay. <clears throat> 15th Amendment. What, what does the 15th Amendment say? This is the uh, Voting Rights Amendment, right? Uh, what does it say? The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race. There it is, race, right there, color, or previous condition of servitude. All those things 
were to all those items there were to give the black man, not not women, man, the vote. But yet here they are. A state is passing legislation that says, you know, literacy tests and, and poll taxes are okay. Okay, <clears throat> so you can pass all the laws and amendments you want. If nobody, if nobody enforces them, it doesn't matter. Okay, <clears throat> okay. And I've said it before, but probably the most profound thing about this class to, to, to come away with, the, the 15th Amendment that, that claims this right here was passed in 1870, but not until 1965, 95 years later, and the passing of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. This happened when I was alive. <clears throat> this is, you know, when, when finally African Americans in the South were were able to register to vote and not face, you know, death, okay? And so I asked the same question a class or two ago, who really won that war, okay? I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to say that the South, even though they lost it militarily, didn't, didn't gain it back. The black people had been in the South had been disenfranchised against the Constitution. They, could, they weren't allowed to vote. The Democrats had no competition, so they... So the so the white supremacists kept their 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 power and their rule. <clears throat> Racial climate hardened, segregation laws proliferated, lynching of African Americans increasingly occurred in broad daylight with crowds of thousands that would gather to watch. And we've already seen this in class, right? These these pictures of these of these men that are, that are happy to have their picture taken in front of people that have just been lynched now what what is what is lynching you know, i mean what is it it's murder it's it's against the law you know you can't you can't hang somebody it, it's murder the other image here on the right they 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 burn somebody and and they're all happily there to to get their pictures taken so it it, it screams about how the law in the south was was not you know being followed and that a white man could do whatever he wanted okay Another thing that uh, uh, that would happen to African American, typically men, is called convict leasing. <clears throat> so what is that? In those days, you know, this is a way to return a black person to slavery. Uh, you would arrest them on a trumped-up vagrancy charge, walking down the street, and you get pulled over. What are you doing? I'm going home. Do you have a job? No. Okay, you're a vagrant. <clears throat> you you are now arrested. <clears throat> And you have to work, you know, hard labor for 60, 90 days. You're going to break rocks with a, with a sledgehammer, okay? 90% of convict laborers were black, okay? Um, you know, a, a huge number. So uh, obviously a trend going on there, right? Okay, out of your book, The Turn the Solid South. <clears throat> what is the solid south? This is the is that was the post reconstruction goal for southern democrats to gain almost complete electoral control of the south get get the electoral control back in the south okay and they wanted to accomplish that <clears throat> by the turn of the 20th century and they did okay <clears throat> okay so all, all all of these items that we're talking about here um uh again is a direct violation of the constitution okay but they they got away with it, okay? Because uh, nobody stopped them, okay? Um, uh, they had effectively removed the black population from the privilege of voting, you know, a privilege that was supposed to be every American's right, okay? I'm going to read from you uh, out of your book. Uh, this is on page 646. You don't have to uh, pull your book out, but if you want to, you can read along with me. And I, th I think that this kind of says it all about, you know, how how the how the South was able to regain their 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 clout after being defeated. Okay, after having the uh, African people, African American people freed. You know, how how are they able to 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 get it back? Okay, so this is on page 646. It's the it's the uh, right column in the second paragraph that starts with with the impact, and then it goes down to the heading new national realities. Okay. Okay, let, let, me, let me read this to you. The impact of the 1890s counter-revolution was dramatically illustrated in Grimes County, a cotton-growing area in East Texas where blacks comprised more than half of the population. 
African-American voters kept the local Republican Party going after Reconstruction and regularly sent black representatives to the Texas legislature. So there you go. You have free men. They're voting. Black people are voting and they're gaining some clout and power so much so that they're sending representatives to the legislature. Okay. Uh, many local white populists, and that would be a part of the, that would be happy for, for, for the African-American growth. Uh, many local white populists dismiss Democrats, Democrats taunts of Negro supremacy and a populist Republican coalition swept the county elections in 1896 and 1898. So the populists and the Republicans win big in, in the, in these elections. Okay. 1896 and 1898. But after their 1898 defeat, Democrats, Southern Democrats in Grimes County organized a secret brotherhood, much like the KKK, okay, and forcibly prevented blacks from voting in town elections, shooting two in cold blood, so murdering people to keep them from voting. The populist sheriff proved unable to bring the murderers to justice. Uh, reconstituted in 1900 as the White Man's Party, Democrats carried Grimes County by an overwhelming margin. So it, go, it goes from, you know, uh, success with the with the African American vote to the next election, no success at all because they were all frightened away from voting because they feared for their lives. Okay, uh, so Democrats carried Grimes County in 1900 by an overwhelming margin. Gunmen then laid siege to the populist sheriff's office killed his brother and a friend, and drove the wounded sheriff out of the county. The white man's party ruled Grimes County for the next 50 years. So all the way up into the you know middle of the 20th century, you have this these people, these white supremacists that take, con take control again, illegally, taking the vote away from people by, by threats of violence and by force, okay? So, so again, this is a this is this paragraph jumped out to me when I when I read this chapter, just as a as a perfect kind of uh, example of of how how the people, the ex Confederate people, white people in the South, were able to regain and 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 get their get their power and and, and get their way of life back. Okay, okay, I'm going to end here. Uh, this is this is part this is lecture one of chapter twenty. So. I'm just going to break it up a little bit to not have such a long, uh, you know, film to watch. So let's go ahead and stop this here and, and then pick up on lecture two. Okay, thank you.